Sorted. Sorted. Excellent. All right, guys. Routing. So now we've got Sentinel, actually, routing becomes much, much simpler. The one of the hard things about routing, I think, is the XOR, this XOR thing. The XOR distance and whatnot is very, very difficult to get your head around and to try and reason with. Especially, it seems the more mathematical you are, the more difficult that is. Uh, so I find it easier. But um, one good thing about routing is all that XOR information is in the routing table. So when we when we want to do something in routing, like work out what's the distance between A and B, or uh, is A closer than C, the routing table does that. Now, you can't do it as A closer than C, because you've got to do with respect to whatever, some target. So the, one of the main things to know about routing is this routing table handles the X or relationship. So anything to do with distance or measurements or any of that sort of stuff, that information's in the routing table. And initially the routing table, when the routing table was written in the sort of previous version of routing, there was actually a note in it that said, don't ever change this. Don't ever touch this because the root table's got stuff in it that you look and think, that's not correct. Like you shouldn't, you should be able to sort something without having a with respect to. Uh, anytime you do, anytime you touch this root table, you should be sweating blood because you should be in a position where maths doesn't make sense anymore and your head's got to be in a, a place that can cope with XOR stuff. So, just the round table on its own, we could probably spend days and days going over and how that works, but Eric has done some pretty good uh, presentations and videos about the round table and the whole XOR networking thing. And things like distance and closeness, uh, all these all these relationships are not obvious, but Eric's covered all of this, so it'd be good today just to say that anything to do with distance, closeness, or whatever is in this XOR space, and the routing table handles that for us in, in the main. The routing table is critical in routing, and in a previous version of routing, we totally screwed it up. Uh, the version of routing that we had in C++ has got enormously screwed up logic. It's completely insecure, but there's an enormously screwed up logic. And here's the fundamental thing about Kademlia based networks. If you take the routing table, it splits in two. So that's a bucket. I think we've called this bucket zero. Then it splits in two again. So bucket one, and it splits in two again. Bucket two, splits in two, bucket three, all the way to 511. Now, if you imagine that the whole XOR address range from you to not you, the complete opposite of you. So you might think zero to FFFF, but you can't think zero to FFF. You've got to think from you to the complete opposite. <coughs> the way the way that the system works is, and it's got to work like this. You know you know some information about this part of the network. So bucket zero, you know some information. So let's call that information that you know a thousand. 
So you know a thousand of this piece of information. Your knowledge, if we could measure knowledge, ranks a thousand there. This bucket here, the knowledge that you would have about this bucket would be 2,000. You'd have double the amount of knowledge you do of this bucket than you do of this bucket. This bucket here would be 4,000, 8,000. So as you send a message across an XOR network, every bucket that you send the message to. So every bucket you send a message to, if it's just one bit away, will have two times the info. <clears throat> and I think the easiest way to explain it in layman's terms is if I was sending a, if I was sending a, a postcard to somewhere in, I don't know, Mexico, Cancun. I would have very little information about Mexico. I might know what continent it's in. And it'll go to that continent so it'll get to South America. South America, they would know where Mexico is. So it goes to Mexico. Mexico, they would know where Cancun is. In Cancun, they would know where the local post office is. The local postman would know where the street is and when it goes through the door the family would know who's supposed to get that letter so when you're going in an XOR network it's very like getting a letter delivered the the next step knows more than you do about the target destination and the closer you get to the target the information is building and building and building and building and building until it's at maximum and it's at maximum the closest you get to the, the destination. So <clears throat> in an XOR network, you always have your message going to where there's more information known about it. In our previous network, we did some weird where we would get to here and then send a message to our side of the network and then send it back and all the rest. So with a massive logic error, that massive logic error leads to hundreds of extra code, all of which is invalid, all of which has got bugs in it, and you're never ever going to get a network that works. Apart from being insecure, we weren't checking signatures and stuff, that was a disaster. So the key element in routing is really there's this routing table which handles this relationship on the network of closeness, distance, and knowledge. Now, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, in a Kademlia type thing, it's a single uh, view of knowledge. You, you always get more knowledge going closer to the target. You never, ever, ever get more knowledge going anywhere else. You've got to go closer to the target. So if you've got an odd 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and you're trying to send it to some target 1, blah, 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 and the next node here has got a 1 there, so it's getting it's getting closer to the target just by one bit. Just one bit closer is two times the info. One bit further away is half the info. It never ever changes. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, where all peers are equal, the distance, uh, the direction of travel of messages is critical. If you break that rule or break the routing table, nothing else matters, nothing's going to save the network, it's completely bust. So in routing we should see the routing table as close to God as we could possibly get and knowing that the XOR stuff or the working with XOR is this 
non-linear, non-Euclidean way of thinking. And one thing that over the years of working with this stuff, I think what, what we've realised in-house is regardless of what expert we're speaking to, professor, whoever, from whatever university, when people make an assumption that's based on linear thinking, it's almost, almost 100% wrong entirely. So when we're looking at stuff in XOR space or relationships between nodes, the amount of non-linear thinking is huge. The only way to make changes to that routing table is to get into that whole mindset and do some measurements, actually measure your assumptions. So for security and whatnot in the routing uh, network, uh, we wrote a tool that actually uh, creates a distributed network in XOR space and then measures things about that network. I, I've yet to meet somebody that can put the XOR thing in their head and actually keep it there and keep thinking that way. Uh, I've not come across anybody that can. But nearly every expert I've came across trips themselves up continually in this space. So what I'm trying to get at, and I hope I'm making the point, is the routing table is the absolute key to routing. Changing that routing table should make us completely petrified because you could make a change which looks correct, it looks like the tests are still working, and the whole network will actually collapse, it will break, there will be security things, stuff will happen that's incredibly bad. So the XOR thing, nothing wrong with working on it, but if you're working on the XOR part or in the room table, do not be considering anything else like sleeping, eating, and all the rest of it. Really get your head in there and stay in there until it's finished and come out again. Uh, it's a hard, 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 hard thing to do. So, <clears throat> in saying that, good news is the routing table's written. It seems to work. There's a fairly substantial test suite which works. Uh, it's pretty complex. I'm on the fence whether it's too complex to be the only test suite we have. I think that something like routing is a prime candidate for a library dedicated to testing it, not tests inside Routin itself. I'm not saying we shouldn't have tests in Routin. I think we should have that as tested as much as anything else, but it's probably a candidate for another library that completely uh, simulates massive networks and tests some of the logic. Uh, just keep that in mind. So in saying that, Routin, so what's the purpose of routing? So in our case, the purpose of routing for us is, along with a transport layer like crust in our uh, suite, is crust is a transport layer, routing is a routing layer, and between the two of them, they give us the ability to implement a DHT. There's lots of DHTs, there's Kadem layer, there's cord, tapestry, pastry, there's the umpteen uh, DHTs kicking about. Kademla is probably the most commonly used one, and our routing table is based on Kademla like uh, routing table, but it's not Kadem. What we have is not Kademla, and it's quite different. So, in a Kademla network, Let's just look at a CAD network. What you generally have is you have a K, a value of K, which is replication. So that's K. So that's the number of copies you're going to make or something. And you'll have nodes. Uh, let's say K equals 4. So we're going to have 4 copies of stuff. And these nodes are in the vicinity of ABC, 
you're storing ABC, you store it to these nodes, and they keep ABC as a key in whatever value. That's primarily what a Kademlin network does. A couple of, couple of things. They here would have a time to live. That defaults generally to 24 hours. So when you see things like BitTorrent or Mainline DHT, uh, all these things, they're based on a Kademla network, which works in this way here. So the time to live, uh, the 24 hours, that's generally a republish time. And basically what the network says is, I'll store this for 24 hours, and I'm not going to store it, I'm just going to drop it. So these guys will have a 24 hour timestamp. And they'll timestamp that and keep that thing for 24 hours. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, which kind of means nodes are going to drop. These guys are whoever's computers, we're not in charge of them. So they're going to drop. So this guy here disappears and there's some other guys in the vicinity. And Kademlia does nothing. So that node drops, there's only three copies now. Nothing happens. So out of these, the, normally your key is eight or 20. In most distributions of Kademlia, the key is eight or 20. So nothing happens here. Then another time goes past and that guy goes, now we'll get two copies. Nothing happened. Nothing's going on. Then the nodes get to a republish time. So republish, republish is what nodes do, and they'll do it every one hour as the default time to republish data on such a network. And what happens is these two guys here that are left will store ABC again. And uh, the ABC will stay here and it will stay here and it will maybe go on this guy and maybe another guy's appeared here. So we've got four copies again. Then the next thing, one goes down, half an hour goes past and then republish happens up until the 24 hour period then the whole data drops. And the client here has to republish before the 24 hours is up and when he, he can overwrite ABC because there's no way that he can tell it not to overwrite it because there's no ownership information on a DHT so you can overwrite on a DHT if you want anything because there's no ownership it's why you won't ever see delete on a DHT either so this guy is going to have to republish ABC of course somebody else can publish ABC and overwrite this guy's data which you can do in BitTorrent networks, not a problem. So <clears throat> there's this lack of ownership and there's a time to live in a republish. So that's one thing that's different. So that's a normal Kademla network. The other thing about a Kademla network that's interesting is they're iterative. Kademla networks are iterative. So You've got a guy here, A, and he's trying to get to ABC group. So obviously he doesn't know the ABC group and he's going to have to find them. So he'll ask K. So if we say K is 4, now as I said, normally it's 8 or 20. He'll send K messages to the closest nodes that he knows of to ABC and they'll all reply to him with the K closest they know of and he will he will accept a minimum number of these replies so say he will accept three 
And once he's got three of those replies, he sorts his, root, his new routing table again with this additional information and sends another K messages out. Then they come back. And this one could have come back. The fourth one of the thing could have come back in the meantime. These guys come back. He sorts his routing table again. And then maybe he's got to here after, after a certain amount of iterations. And if you look even in two iterations with a K of four, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight holes you would have to put, eight things you'd have to punch out through your router. Now if that was 20 and you're looking at 10 iterations, that's 200 per request. Holes getting, and if that was on a LAN, this router's getting pummeled with holes getting all UDP ports opening. And a UDP port opens, it'll stay open for 20 to 30 seconds. So if you've got a bunch of these guys in a network with this iterative approach, you're going to get slammered. Now, that's not all. So an iterative approach, and you see, I said earlier, that guy goes off, nobody even notices. Nobody knows he's went off. So let's say this guy was called X. These fellas here, after several iterations, no, X is quite close. No, send back X. You should be speaking to X. This guy here will send out to X, who's not there anymore. These guys haven't been told X isn't there. So they're keeping him in the routing table as a dead node. So these messages that are going to go out to X are going to time out eventually. And nothing happens. These guys still think X is there. This is a normal DHT. Now, there's a thing called downlist notification. Now, when this happens, this guy here should go back to this guy and say, X doesn't exist anymore. Then this guy should actually try and ping X to see, does he? Has this guy been telling me the truth? And you get into this, you get into this way that this network gets pretty confused there's a lot of traffic happens during the refresh time. These guys will all try and refresh it 30 minute thing. So you get a flood happening. And then there's an improvement called beta refresh to try and make these guys refresh at different times based on some uh, factors to try and improve that refresh. But for a period of normally an hour, you don't know how many of these nodes has went off. You've got copies disappeared. You don't end about these guys. And you hope that K is big enough that the whole group doesn't collapse and doesn't disappear and take your data with it. <coughs> the data itself is not keyed. It's just basically a key and a value. Uh, there's no type of data, there's just one type of data. It's whatever type has got that key and that value. So you don't get immutable data, you know, mutable data, structured data. You don't get that, you just get data. It's a key and a value. It may or may not be there. It's very inefficient. There's network flooding happens. You don't know when nodes disappear. The refresh rate will determine how fresh your table is. The longer you're on without a downlist, the longer the routing table gets poisoned that you're in and you give off bad information to people. That's a normal Kademlia network. And it's enormously successful, hugely successful. Uh, you don't often hear that BitTorrent's not working or you know, some of these DHTs just are broken. And the iterative thing knocks lumps out of routers. These guys don't know if our group's really there or if they are the closest group. Uh, we don't know how much of our room table's poisoned and not poisoned. And we really don't know if the data's there. And even if it is there, we hope that the guy who put it there is going to republish it again somehow. So with all of those errors, all of that, 
all of that extra traffic, all of that bad information in routing tables, this works. And it works probably better than a server-based system. BitTorrent certainly seems to be able to download information much quicker than extremely expensive servers. And it's based on people having a computer on running a program for just a little while, not for a great big huge amount of time, not incentivized whatsoever to do so, and uh, running a piece of software which does this, which has got all these errors. So one of the <clears throat> one of the first places to attack for us really with the routing thing is this refresh thing. So we look at the refresh and we say this is the group for ABC. Now, if we increase the refresh or decrease the refresh timeout, so increase the number of refreshes, this group will be more accurate. So if you if you have a refresh time of zero or as close to zero seconds as you can get, you're going to get the most accurate DHT that you can imagine. That's one thing that's interesting. Another thing is DHTs are quite an academic thing. So you've got your client, you've got your router. And as I say, when he's doing iterative lookups, he's going to knock lumps out of opening UDP ports in this router. And if there's a couple of them, they're really going to knock lumps out of these routers. So the UDP port usage is going to be ridiculous. So this is where introducing take away the iterative approach and make it recursive. So you've got your router and you're going to have a fixed number of ports used. So in our case, 64. We're going to use 64. Regardless of the number of iterations that we use here, the number of searches per second or whatever, these are the 64 ports that are open. We're not knocking lumps out that router. So immediately we've got something quite good happening. Now, the recursive thing for us means use crust. So we take all the UDP type connectionless connections and make them connection oriented, which means in your group here, these guys are all connected to each other. And as soon as one goes off, and if it goes off gracefully, we'll get a message coming back. We know immediately that that guy's gone off, and these guys can go into a republish mode. Immediately. Taking refresh as close to zero as is possible using network technology available to us today. So if we get a, a graceful logout, we'll know within milliseconds. If we get an ungraceful logout, a collapse, a, a network going off, DHCP change of address or something, we'll find out in seconds it won't be minutes or anything like that. So if you take the 60 minute thing of a normal DHT to get its routing table right in terms of refresh, it'll never be right in terms of dead nodes because you, you're, you're screwed there. If you take that 60 minutes and go down to milliseconds to seconds, that's how much more accurate your DHT is going to be for a start. So that, that was a that was a good thing to notice. It was a good thing for us to find out that we could bring this refresh 
thing down. The other thing is, you're connected here, and we're doing this iterative thing. So if we were able to actually, and again, this is the non-academic side of routing, this is real world thing, this guy has to have a listen port that's available to the world. Here, we can punch a hole through that router and get a listening port where we use hole punching, or if it's TCP, uh, UPnP, NAPnP, or whatever. And once we've done the work of getting that information, the network can be told about it, the network can be told, this guy has got these listening ports available. Also, the routing table for every node in the network wins the same reward as the refresh thing. Our routing tables are as fresh as possible using today's network technology. Now having good routing tables means immediately we're saving on bandwidth because we're not sending bad packets, corrupt packets, or having to resend stuff. Now we have the connection uh, orientation here, so we're not we're not saying that we are more bandwidth efficient because we might actually be using more bandwidth between these two guys than we normally would because we are sending keep alive or TCPs doing that anyway, you just don't see it. It's that degrees of separation we think because in TCP you don't see it, it's not there, but it is there. So it's established that the keep alive between two guys is something that networks live with and they live with really well. We're not firing it right across the network. So for us, this recursive thing saves us on ports, but to become recursive, we actually adjust the routing table so that these are constantly connected guys. So we'll get fresh routing tables. So we get fresh routing tables and we've got a, a refresh rate which a normal Kademlia network couldn't even dream of getting close to without flooding the whole internet. And this is this is where routing deviates from Kademlia networks significantly. Now, there's a lot there's a lot more small bits to it, but this is just a kind of backgrounder as to folk keep saying we're just a DHT or we're Kademli or something like that, we're kind of, but we're not really. Now, the downside of that is, if you look at your Kademli routing table, and I was saying before, you've got this thing, so we've got 511 buckets, 511 slots, if it was a true Kademla routing table, then we might have number of nodes per bucket. In a lot of Kademla implementations, that's also K, which would be 8 or 20. So for us, we would be looking at, say, a K of 4. So we'd be looking at over 2,000 nodes. If we maintained a proper Kademla routing table, we'd, we'd need over 2,000 nodes. So that'll be 2,000 connections, uh, which is too much for us. So what we've done with the routing table is we have said 64 buckets is what we're dealing with, or more accurately, 64 connections. And immediately folks go, oh my god, that's not right, it's blah blah blah. And uh, you get all the bullshit stuff. But we did some, there was a, one of the lassies that worked for us actually, she was into maths and things. And just, to, just as a side thing, just so that you know, for a network population of 7 billion, and you've got a, a hash table, you know, to F, of 2 to the 512 address range. Every second node obviously goes into this bucket. So if you start with a 1, everything that starts with zeros going in there. Then every 4th node's going in there, 8th node's going in there. 
it transpires to if you got a full Kademlia routing table and a network population of seven billion, you'll only have nodes in thirty three buckets. If you're looking at potential sixty four. So we're saying of our sixty four nodes that thirty two of them were treating special. These are special nodes. And that we do not care how many of these 32 nodes that are our closest nodes, even if they're all in one bucket, we don't care. It's okay. So for our close group, we are saying the bucket notation doesn't matter. However many buckets those 32 nodes span, they're closest to us. We don't care. We really don't care. The remaining 32 nodes, wait, we do have the Kademlia routing table pattern. So the remaining 32 nodes are actually put into the Kademlia routing table in a Kademlia fashion. So we do differentiate there. And again, that's just background information. That's in the routing table. As I say, don't change stuff in that routing table. Really, <laughs> it's important. So, what do we have in routing? So we've got crust here, and what crust will do for us is it will connect to a network somewhere. It will connect to a network somewhere, one that we're previously connected to, and it will make connections. So if crust has got UTP and TCP, that'll make at least those couple of connections. So it should make a connection per protocol. That'll keep a bootstrap list of nodes that it knows that it could get to. These are the nodes that could get through the router and have a listening port that we can access from anywhere else. So we'll keep that bootstrap list. So Crust will basically connect to the network and it will kind of say to us, OK, I'm on the network. Uh, I'm probably connected to people that you don't want to be connected to, but that doesn't matter. I'm connected to people on your network. So I can route information for you. So I can, I can route information as far as you can tell me who to connect to. So you think, well, that's kind of rubbish because Crust is connected to two or three guys who are probably not connected to anybody else. They might be, we don't know. How does it know how to do routing? And this is the key. Crust is completely dumb. It knows nothing about routing. It knows how to connect to networks. It knows how to reconnect to networks. It will know how to do that in a multi-protocol way. And it will know how to do it in a way that it can check the NAT traversal parameters and all the rest of it, and it'll connect back. <coughs> so how do we work in routing then with this pretty dumb object? Because we can't connect to this and say, could you now connect to whatever uh, using a Kademli address? It won't work because it doesn't know anything about these things. So what routing does, it starts a node. The very first node in the routing network starts, and it'll listen through crust. It'll listen. So node one. So node two starts and connects to node one, and they pass some information saying, "Who are you?" And then he goes, "Who, who, who?" Uh, so th they discover. This guy discovers that he's node one, and this guy discovers he's node two. And then they want to make a connection, proper connection with each other, the way that routing nodes would work. So this guy here says, I really want to connect to somebody who's called node X. So this guy is a routing node. He's got his own routing table. And this guy here says, right, I've connected to you, node one, but I don't really care about you. 
I want to connect to Node X. And this guy here doesn't know anything about Node X. He's like, oh, what, what are you talking about? Node X. So what what we do is we need to do something to get from the IP network to the let's call it routing network. IP is using IP addressing RIP and all the rest of that stuff. Routing is using a sort of Kademlia like thing. So we need to get up to the Kademlia thing to find information about who we want to connect to. So Initially, when we start, we're quite we're quite dumb. We say, "Well, we're node two. We should be connected to some people, but I wonder who we should be connected to." So we're not on the network. We're we're still at the IP network here. We're just on the IP network. We're not in the Kademlia network at all, or the routing network. So what we need to do is this guy's on the routing network, node one. The whole world and routing knows about him. If there is any whole world. If there's not, he's just on his own. That's perfectly okay. So we need to send a thing that says, get me some information, get some info. And what we do is we send a group for node two. So we're saying to this guy here, we're, saying, we're trying to say to network, get group for node two. But over here, you've got the DHT and it can't speak back to us, it can't get back to us because we're not on the DHT, remember we're still in the IP network you know the routing network's up here we're not on it, we're not joined it, we're trying to join it so we're not for there yet so we, did, we, send, we need to send us get group for node 2 so that we can get some contact information back that we can uh, try and connect to and how we do that is we relay via node 1 and that's pretty straightforward so the network, the DHT sees a message from node 1 looking for get group 2 and it gets the information and sends it back to node 1 and node 1 then gives it back to us and that's just done through a relay address so when you send this guy here sends the message with this guy as the source, him as the relay. When it comes back from being answered, that relay address is taken out the source and put into the destination again. Comes back here, he sees the messages for him, but notices, ah, there's a relay address for node 2. So I, I give it to node 2 because I'm connected to him. He's down here in this IP world, he's not in the routing world. So I'll give this message to him. This guy here then knows the IDs, the routing IDs. The IDs from the routing world. It knows then that it should be connected to. So it says, right, I know who I should be connected to, but I've got no idea how to talk to them because I'm down here in the pits of IP and I need to get up to the routing layer. So he sends another message for each of the IDs, so ID 1, he'll send a connect message saying please connect to me and he'll sign it. And that again will go through here as a relay message to the DHT network and ID 1 over here will see Oh, that's a connect request from somebody that I should be connected to because he's got an ID. Uh, Sentinel does the checking of uh, keys and everything, so we'll leave that for Sentinel. So this guy says, I want to connect to ID 1. He sees, and this guy might make millions of connect requests to get three or four connections uh, later on that you'll see how that happens, but keep in mind that getting your close, close group connections is probably a one-to-one, -one. you'll ask for a connection and get it. Getting the other connections in your routing table 
you could be looking at millions of attempts. So this guy doesn't hold the state of this connect request. Importantly, he doesn't hold the state, and that's vital. Because that state could be millions, and you can do nothing with it anyway. But if somebody doesn't connect to you, what do you do? Beg them. You know, there's no point holding that state. So we send all the state away here. We say am ID one. Here's the connection parameters that I've got. I might have several connection types. I'm trying to connect to you in TCP, say, or UTP. This goes here, and the ID one node says, okay, I've got that. It's signed. I'm going to send back my connection stuff here to this guy, and this guy says, whoa. ID1 wants to connect to me, the connect response, which means I must have asked him to connect. But how do we know that's not a hacker? Uh, somebody could just be sending a connect request and doing something bizarre, we don't know. So when the connect request, when the connect request comes back, it's this connect response, the original connect request signed by you, by the by this node here, node two, he'll have that. So he gets his own parameters back plus his own signature back, saying this is what you asked me. Uh, and here you've signed it yourself, so you can easily check it. And here's how you can connect to me. So it's saying, here's my connection parameters, here's your connection parameters, let's connect. When that connection then uh, gets established, this guy here moves up into the routing. Okay. So he becomes on the routing node, uh, routing network now, and he can speak for himself. So initially, when you're not on the routing network, you have to relay through another node who's on the routing network, and then you, once you've, once you've got your connection established, you can you appear on the routing network again, so you can speak to the routing network. <coughs> so, in routing, that's how we do a connect, and that's how we get on to the routing network from the excellent work that Crust does to get us onto the IP. He needs to get us onto the IP network, so he needs to connect us to an IP address that's already on the routing network, but at the IP layer. So Crust does that part for us, and then we just use them to get onto the other network. <clears throat> so we already know we've got a recursive network here, but there's a thing that we do called the swarm, and I'll just fly over this because I think everybody knows about it. These four guys, I'll just draw them like this, are supposed to be connected to each other. However, Let's say this guy here is behind a symmetric router, and so is this guy. So they can't actually establish that connection. It doesn't work for them for whatever reason. Probably about 30% of connections will be like this. They can't establish it. But that's the group, the group for ABC. So these guys need to be able to speak. So they do because they have to make agreement on actions and all the rest of it on the network. So how we get around that is whenever a message on the network comes into this group and it's destined for anywhere within that group, whether it's for that individual node or for just a group in general, any node picking that message up in here sends it to every node he can speak to, and they send it once. So this guy here got the message, and he'll send it once to everybody. So you get this swarm thing. And what that means is, no matter where the message comes in, everybody's going to get it. So he's going to give it to him, and him, and him. So even though these guys couldn't speak, they got the same message. Same with uh, if he logs out with a node down, I've gone down, he'll get it, he'll get it, and they'll transmit it as well, so he'll get told. If this guy here 
notices he's got a note down, he does the swarm thing. And this guy finds out anyway. So the swarm approach allows us to make nodes that aren't actually connected look like they are at the cost of some extra traffic. And that extra traffic's that extra traffic there is more than worth it uh, because trying to answer that question by saying let's make him send it and we'll sign this and blah 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 you start ending up having to trust trust less than a group and that doesn't work uh, all you end up with is piles and piles and piles of complicated code or just ignore the problem uh, which <laughs> we've done, which wasn't a good thing. Uh, the other <clears throat> main part of routing, as you know, is we've got group and quorum. And so that's obviously from 0 to x, and then there's the quorum size in there. And this this distance here, this number of nodes here, uh, represents to us our error acceptance. So what we are saying with the quorum size is we are prepared to live with and accept a certain level of error in the system, but the error can't be too dramatic that it's going to uh, it's going to be a quorum down here with one node telling the truth. The quorum size has to be fairly high. <coughs> and we've measured this from a security perspective. And with that quorum size of 19 or more, we've got something like 60, I don't know, 60 something percent attack vector. And that means when you've got the network kicking about the place and you've got a quorum of 19 that when you take imagine there's 19 things in there when you take the network population if you try and create 19 nodes all close together you're going to have to have some. I think it's something like 63% of all the nodes in the network so if the network sell at 100 nodes, you're going to have to add something like, I don't know, 140. Now, when you're adding that 140, nobody else is able to add nodes, only you, to get these figures. So it's very hard. The, the point here is the quorum size of 19, group size of 32, it seems to give us, we, we did group size down there at 23 I think and we noticed that there wasn't enough error margin some things in the Sentinel weren't working right and what we did was we increased the group size to 32 to give us more of an error margin but we maintained this security size here and that security size is important if you are able to add 140 nodes to a 100 node network and prevent anybody else adding a node the chances are that you would be able to get a group here uh, so that becomes it becomes quite a powerful thing because that sixty odd percent attack is ultra ultra conservative. I think everyone would have to be going in their favour to be able to attack your network that way. So the routing network is very focused on this group and quorum size, and there's a there's a thing called address space tool. and the C++ library, which if you run it, you can play about with these figures and you can see the attack sizes and you can see how that's coded. So routing specifically is what adds the routability, if you like, or the routing capability to an IP network. So you've got IP and you've got routing. And routing basically is saying a few things. It's saying uh, that we'll be able to find stuff. 
on the network and when you add Sentinel in it gives you a whole bunch of security things but also Rutan's kind of saying well, we're going to provide security via these quorum sizes via say a quorum so a particular group size or a quorum you can imagine quorum just being a group size if you ignore the error part of it so we're going to provide security via a quorum and at the moment it doesn't <laughs> so at the moment it doesn't provide any security even with the sentinel so if we again have this group we see the networks here and we are saying it's 60 say it's 63 percent attack so you add start adding nodes in and eventually they'll go in here however at the moment you just create a key pair and store it and then join the network so you can get into that group by just offline creating key pairs like mad <coughs> and to add <laughs> add salt to the injury we've just moved to blood sodium which will allow you to create a hundred and something thousand key pairs per second so you could you could say well I need an address of close to ABC and just create, create key pairs until you get that address and then you're in so you break all the quorum stuff so one of the important things about written that it has to do is what we'll call address relocation and address relocation takes away this offline attack just removes it and what that means is and it's part of the readme just now you'll try and store a key ABC so that'll get close to the group ABC so this guy here ABA A B D blah 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 and what this group will say oh I've seen a store ABC so we'll take that message ABC and we'll add in the two closest IDs to ABC so these ones so we add that and then hash it again and then give it back to this guy and say this is your ID to join the network with so here now that can be improved because these guys here could go and store it and various stuff so the key point here is this address relocation needs to be carefully considered that you're not allowed to store ABC uh, you're not allowed just to create any key pair that you want and then store it when that key pair written uses session keys so when that key pair goes to whatever that PQR if that became PQR so it goes to PQR and 10 minute cache so that guy's got 10 minutes to then go and connect to there or else they'll drop his key and they'll have to start again that's how address relocation can be shown in its most simplified manner so written really at the moment isn't if you take the if you take the address relocations to get done, if you take routing, you've got the routing table, you've got your connect message, connect response, get group, and then you're going to have a couple of get keys, which you're going to pass to the sentinel. And then you've got the trait requirements and you've got this authority I've not really been over the authority it's pretty simple uh, we can from the message traits we can say what's the name of this piece of data I'm a network address element manager or I'm a 
node manager or client manager, the authorities, that's explained plenty of times in that blog post, and then the authority code itself is very simple, so you can see it. But routing is really, yeah, routing is really just those components and nothing else. So there you go, that's, uh, that's your very quick, brief routing overview. I'm going to mute myself now. Yeah. Sweet. Are you guys good with that one? Ben and Peter? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Peter. No, uh, Viv, could you say it again? Because uh, my. I was, just, is... I was just saying, are you guys good with that one so that we can wrap this one up? Yeah, I think okay, so. Sure. Yeah, we'll ask questions tomorrow.